what's so exciting about the field of philanthropy is how much it's being disrupted, how many new opportunities there are to do new and exciting things. And we were really proud to be part of just one of those things last year when, with a lot of the people in the room today, we launched Giving Tuesday. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Giving Tuesday. And what was so fascinating about that was within 70 days, driven by social media, a community of people in all 50 states from a small family to a large multinational all came together under one umbrella to do something new with giving. And really that's the theme of what we'll talk about this afternoon. We'll talk about that something new with giving. Because for those people living in the giving space, what's so exciting right now is the opportunities ahead and the opportunities which will be within your career lifespans are so excited to fundamentally transform the way we interact with the people we care about. That's something very different than giving. It's something about interacting with the people we care about. You know, one of the big shifts we've been observing is that the shift that social media brings to the philanthropy sector is from where we were as organizations, we were kind of content creators. We create our guidebook, we put our donor letter to go out each year, we create this content, and we'd hope people respond. But the shift we're seeing with social media is we're not just content creators, we are context creators. What's much more interesting with social giving is not what we give to people, but how we can encourage people to change their behaviors. And that encouraging people to change their behaviors will really be the theme of this afternoon. So we have a range of perspectives in the room, and uh, most of the conversation is, is going to be geared towards you know, leadership issues around the use of social media, both the tool set and the mindset. But the mindset has to co come first. So what does it be to, be, to use social media for leadership and, uh, and scale it within your organization? What does that change actually look like from the inside out? And then we're going to look at kind of, um, so that's like up on the balcony, if you will, the balcony issue. The other balcony issue, we'll look at what are, you know, what can we learn from movements of people, people-powered campaigns, and, and what do nonprofit leaders need to know about those to leverage them, to enhance them, um, to reach social change outcomes. And so those are all the balcony issues. Then we're going to get on the dance floor. Literally, and we're going to talk about tools, and we're going to have um, Sharon Fetter from Mashable, uh, because leaders, I think, not only do we have to see the big picture and the road ahead and the trends, but I think to really understand the, what, what this shift is in our culture and the way and, and what this disruptive technology is doing, we need to put our hands on it. And for those of you who mentioned that you're just beginning or not comfortable, I want to share something. I'm having a T-shirt made that says "Comfort Zone equals Dead Zone." Okay, I spent a year writing a book about measurement and I flunked math in eighth grade, okay? Talk about, and I avoided it for, I, I knew that this book had to be written. I said, I'm not gonna write a book about measurement because I can't do math, I can't do Excel. And then I said, no, I can learn this. And I published a book on measurement. Now I love it. So, so the, the idea is that we learn how to learn, okay? So being prepared to learn how to learn um, I, we're going to be doing, um, it's going to be interactive as well as sharing content. So Udi, why don't you um, introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Udi Ofer and I'm the executive director of the ACLU of New Jersey. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the ACLU obviously is one of the nation's largest human rights, civil rights organization. And the New Jersey affiliate has 15,000 members. Um, it's all over the Garden State and it's one of the more it's one of the largest ACLU affiliates in the country. Uh, before I was there, I was actually the advocacy director at the ACLU of New York, where a lot of what I did was also you know, thinking beyond litigation as a tactic um, to pursue social justice. I'm a lawyer by training, so for me, you know, going into the social media world is actually not a natural fit. It's one that I had to force a bit. I thought lawyers don't tweet. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm always worried about some um, liability. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, privacy, right? And pri privacy. Well, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I think this is where, obviously, being an ACLU attorney, like, privacy is obviously a very important component of our work. But at the same time, I think there's also, I don't know, I've been on Facebook for a decade. I'm not as concerned about things that I proactively put out there. So I actually met you because I was looking at Instagram. Everyone, we know what Instagram is, you know, a photo sharing. And I happened to see a photo of you with the sign that said, ask me anything. Right. And, um, and we ended up doing an interview around, okay, so you're a CEO, you're the head of the ACLU, ACLU, and you're on Twitter, and you're on YouTube, and you have the sign saying, ask me anything. So 
Why are you doing that? Right. Well, I got to say, that was actually the brainchild of our communications department, and Katie Wang is our communications director. Um, um, the idea behind, so I started at ACLU in New Jersey two and a half months ago, and the idea was to introduce me to our community of members. Um, and our communications department figured, well, wh how fun would it be to do a short five-minute video where you can a answer any questions that the ACLU community asks of you? So we put it out there on Facebook, on Twitter, and other Weren't social... Were you afraid? Um, well, I wasn't afraid because we handpicked which questions we were going to answer. Oh, okay. So it's not as if we didn't have control over it. And there were definitely some questions that we wanted to stay out of and not answer. Um, but it was... What? <laughs> <laughs> not, this is when the lawyer is going to come in. Okay. Um, but, uh, but it was actually, you know, it was a, you know, I, it was, it was a bit weird, like being a second week on the job and sitting with my, one of my communication staff people. And we purposely wanted to give it kind of a grassroots feel. So we did the, the video over a laptop to make it feel a bit less professional, um, which was purposeful, which I think is really important for social media. Um, and then it was just, it was a nice conversation. It ended up being a bit funny. Like for example, one of the questions that was asked was, what's my favorite karaoke song? And that was actually one oh, of the most fun ones. Oh, you sing it for us? <laughs> <laughs> After a few drinks. Well, you know, I wanted to give a bit of a New Jersey, um, you know, slant to it. So I definitely pulled some Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you were, I mean, are you an, were you an old hand on Twitter and, you know, right. are you a digital native? Right. So I'm definitely not a Luddite. Um, and I used, you know, Facebook for many years and I like technology. I have an, uh, you know, an iPhone, Apple and so forth, but I actually never used Twitter before starting this job, and it was really my communications department, even before I started, was asked me, you know, what do you want your Twitter handle to be? And I was like, I have no idea. They suggested one for me, and within my first week on the job, I had a tweetorial, which was... What's a tweetorial? Tweetorial is amazing. <laughs> I can't even say it. Tweetorial. Um, but it was uh, a, literally a two-page briefer that was prepared by my communications department that was just the basics of tweeting. Um, you know, everything, just the basic language and how to talk about it, which it could be awkward for new people, to the mechanics of it. And the, whole, and the whole tutorial lasted maybe 20 minutes. So the learning, while it may feel intimidating, actually the learning curve to le learn the mechanics are actually quite simple. It's a very simple application. But where did you find the time? Right. Where so, did you, find, you know, when I posted yeah. the story uh, about you on my blog, there were, you know, comments and somebody said, you know, I'm, I'm a donor to the ACLU, and like, I really wonder why the executive director should be spending his time tweeting. I think he should be cultivating big donors. And, you know, what was your answer to that? Yeah, I read it, and my heart skipped a bit. Um, <laughs> you know, here's the deal. It is actually not that time-consuming, I, I believe. You know, I I re in response to that post, I said, I spend maybe a half an hour to 40, 45 minutes on a busy day, a half an hour on a regular day on Twitter. But most of it is done through three to four minute segments. So literally, I tweet in between doing other stuff. And the term that I used, I think, on your post was, it's fill-in time. Um, I, you know, it's time that I actually I think otherwise would not be used for any kind of purpose other than maybe reading something or catching up on reading emails. But I find that I use it when I just read a really interesting article on the train to work. My immediate reaction now is to post it on Twitter. Um, you know, there's some, I just had a conversation and I had a thought about it. You know, so it's three to four minute gaps of time that I think otherwise would not be used as valuably. Having said that, there are times where you do put in more of an effort and you're kind of more proactive and you know that at a certain period you want to send out a certain message where it's pre-planned. But I would say that's the minority of the time and the majority of the time is actually in three to four minute segments. So how is your presence on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube, how is this yeah. in service of the ACLU's mission? I got to say the part that's actually surprised me the most is how much I've learned. I think a lot of people think of social media as purely only in a way to put out your message, which is obviously a very important component, but I actually find that I am so much more informed on some of the most important policy issues that I've been working on for years purely by subscribing to the right feeds and following the right people. So it's like a form of professional development? It's absolutely a form of <laughs> professional development. Is it a and networking, professional networking. It's networking, and I said this, I think, in your post. I actually think it's a bit irresponsible for anyone who's in the policy arena not to track the conversations that are happening on Twitter and other social media sites by the policy makers. 
So I'm amazed by how much of a conversation was already engaged in some bills that I'm actually you know, shepherding through the legislative process, and there are people having that conversation about those bills that I actually wasn't aware of until I started subscribing, following their feeds. So it actually, I think it saves time in the sense of, I'm sure all of you have the blogs that you like to visit. So instead of visiting 20 different blogs, you can now get a briefing you know, through your feeds, and it's- But isn't it overwhelming? Right, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's reading two sentences. Um, it's actually, it hasn't been overwhelming at all. It is a bit addictive, I will admit to that, and I'm actually trying to find the right balance, because it's such instant gratification, and it's such like instant information, that then you find yourself, it's like, okay, I want more. Um, and you're kind of, you're looking for more feeds on it. So it could be addictive, and I would say that's actually where you need to check yourself and not let it kind of take over your downtime. So once you get over the fear, you enter addiction. And I know, I'm trying to find... Beyond addiction, you get moderation. Can I lie down? Because I feel like this is now moving to a therapy session, which okay. I like. <laughs> you know, if you were talking to a group of executive directors from nonprofits yeah. who um, were like, at first, maybe skeptical, and now they're kind of like, okay, I, I know this is important. I want to get started. What would be your, you know, how to get started advice? Yeah. What should they do? I would say the most important thing is obviously spend those 20 minutes to learn the mechanics. And don't don't be intimidated by it. It's actually pretty straightforward. Secondly, I think the best way to start off, look, you all read interesting reports, interesting newspaper articles. Just post, about, tweet about those articles. Like literally just say a sentence about an article that you just read and you want your community to know about. I would say that that's how I started. And originally my goal was maybe to tweet once a day, literally. Um, and I was like, maybe we could do twice a day. But now I find myself tweeting like five, six times a day just because I want to. Like I want to share information that I've learned with my community of people. So, so set a small goal, get comfortable with the me mechanics, and let it grow from there. And I think I would also add lean on your staff. Well, and that's another thing. I mean, my communication staff is always available to help me with these things. Do they ghost tweet for you? So originally <laughs> I thought that they would and they offered. But on a practical level, I think it's maybe happened once, maybe twice, where they, but I do ask, and I do think this is important for executive directors, nothing should ever be posted without your approval. How do we judge whether we're going in the right direction? So when you're talking to traditional top-down leaders and you're talking about movements, how do you explain this phenomena to them and why it's important, why they should pay attention? Well, I think, um you know, everyone in positions of authority now feels very vulnerable in a way that I think is extremely healthy. When you see, um, when you see people being thrown out, when you see the Mubareks or the Gaddafis brought down on the extreme form, but you see, um, you know, the potential for one slip, one mention of 47% in a campaign meeting turns into a video, turns into the end of your presidential hopes. Um, people are very nervous. Uh, they understand that the world is changing um, and they, they need to engage with that. And the, the fact that China reacts so heavy-handedly to um, the rise of uh, social media and so forth tells you that this, they understand this is a very powerful force and they don't know how to handle it and they are very afraid. So how do you make them less afraid? Do you want to make them less afraid? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's pretty healthy. I mean, hopefully they, the response that they will, they will have, and, and it's interesting, Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum is extremely articulate and in favor of, at least in his, his talking, about how this is going to empower uh, ordinary people to, to play a much greater role in their deliberations and how they can be more transparent and how you know, they, have, they, they had quite early on a YouTube contest and 10 people got to go to the World Economic Forum on the basis of their pitch that they made on, on YouTube. So they've been quite good at engaging with that. Right? But hopefully this will lead to, to them recognizing that a different style of leadership is needed, a different way of engaging with people. So what think, is that style of leadership? Well, I think it is. A, it, it's, it's a style. I mean, the thing, the thing you learn very quickly, I think, when, as soon as you start tweeting or do any of this social media stuff is that you are instantly visible in everything you do and people are if there's no integrity there, you get found out very quickly. If you say something stupid, you get found out very quickly. And you know, that, that, that style of leadership has to, be, has to be one that is really welcoming crowd sourcing of yeah. ideas, of, 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 so of being building, more transparent building and, consent, and building broader organizations. So all the things that civil society has gone on about for so long actually is now 
really, I think, has to be part of any, any leader's daily routine. I think that was one of the things about Obama that puzzled me, is that he used it so well in getting elected. And then why wasn't there the daily kind of uh, him live, live screening the cabinet meeting or something like that? I mean, why wasn't that happening? And so everyone suddenly felt, hang on, he's lost the plot. He, he's gone back to being old power when he was new power and getting elected. Now, Jeremy, I read something interesting in your bio that you have been building movements since you were eight years old. Um, and, that, and it's something that you've continued to do in your adult years. And I'm wondering if you can um, articulate what you think some of the, the best practices or philosophies are about building movements. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm nine now, so... Uh, so <laughs> in internet years? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, so, I mean, look, you know, when I was a, a, a child activist, um, the internet wasn't really around, or certainly not like, widely available, and so we used whatever technology we had at, at our disposal. So when I was, you know, 13, and the, uh, the Gulf War was about to happen, the first Gulf War in 1991, I organised a campaign to send faxes to, uh, to uh, James Baker and Tarek Aziz on the eve of their, uh, of their final negotiation before the war started. That was obviously not as effective as, as some of the work that we've done since then. Um, but I think one of the things that I say to people is, is not to fixate on the technology. And sometimes you see people uh, focus on, oh, this is this cool new early adopter technology. Let's put 80% of our focus on our Pinterest strategy, um, you know, rather than thinking, where, how do we meet people where they are? And so in our work at Purpose, we try to meet people where they are wherever possible. And so one of the first things I'd say is, is not to focus on the technology, but to actually focus on the, um, on, on the, the organizational design that you bring to the table. That's actually much more important than what technology you're using, right? Which is that large bureaucratic risk averse organizations typically don't do movement building well. How many of you work for large well. bureaucratic risk um, <laughs> adverse organizations? You don't have to raise your hand, but. So, 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 you know, so if you're in one of those organizations, the question becomes uh, not how do you give up because there's actually plenty of opportunity, but how do you carve out a space for innovation where you can protect uh, the people who need to do the kind of work that's about grassroots engagement from the pathologies of the organization itself. How do you create an innovation team that's protected, that can make a whole bunch of decisions that are only vetoed in exceptional circumstances, for example, that can do the kind of public engagement that you want? And I think often when, when our, we sort of work with NGOs, what we see is that like there are certain structural factors that are impeding their ability to be this transparent, authentic so personality what, of which you speak, and, and those need those? to be addressed first. What are some of those structural factors? Well, so for example, if you know, you've got an organization that has inherent kind of uh, turf conflicts between fundraising, policy, communications, et cetera, et cetera, as many large NGOs have, then what you end up doing is all of those um, groups are kind of, uh, there's, a, there's a contestation around uh, that voice, around the content, that results in a kind of diluted mishmash, right? So if you're going to make this stuff work, you have to carve out and protect the people who are doing that work and allow them to do it in a way that replicates the experiments in movement building that have been successful, that typically aren't large organizations initiating them. They're small groups of relatively free people applying entrepreneurial principles to their work. So there is a way to do that. I mean, we've developed this concept of an action factory as a way to work with big NGOs, but to take them out of some of the, those dynamics that we've described. But unless you do that very intentionally, you can have the best social media strategy in the world, but the organizational issues are ultimately going to be more important than the quality of your strategy. And I bet many of you are plugging away with brilliant strategies that are somewhat hampered in your capacity to implement them. So I think that there's an interesting dance there that people don't focus enough on those issues and then they wonder why things aren't popping and succeeding the way more early stage, smaller groups are able to get things off the ground. So I've heard three best practices. I've heard um, being transparent and being off and the second one of being authentic. Um, you know, if you make a mistake, own up to it. If you say something stupid, don't just delete your tweet or you'll get caught. And this whole other thing, which is more of uh, an internal issue around how organizations are structured, particularly around their digital work. And so it's kind of like tear down the silos. We're going to talk about tools first from the perspective of an individual and maybe getting everyone on staff using these tools or maybe the executive director. So what, do you, what is your single most valuable um, social media tool and why? So I think mine is one that we've talked about a lot today. It's Twitter. Um, for me, Twitter is really useful because it's both 
uh, discovery. I discover great content there. Um, it's thought leadership. I get to talk about what I care about. Um, and also, it's a method of distribution so that when Mashable or Giving Tuesday does something fantastic, I get to introduce it to the people who follow me. So what is your Twitter routine? Uh, so for me, it has to be sort of careful because, you know, as a couple of people mentioned already, Twitter can be a huge time suck. It can be incredibly overwhelming just like any other social media tool or platform. Uh, so for me, it's really about finding the time during the day when I want to check it and I want to engage on it um, so that I'm not constantly looking at it, which means in the morning, uh, generally soon after waking up, I'm looking at some of the people that I follow that I've put on lists, and I could talk about that in a little bit, um, that I view as thought leaders that I want to provide my news in the morning um, instead of looking at maybe a traditional news site. Um, and then throughout the day, I'm checking in and looking to see what's happening in the world. For me, it is where I get a lot of my news. Uh, and then checking in with a lot of the people that I follow there to either retweet what they're talking about or to engage with them. So how does, you know, let's say we have someone who's fairly new to Twitter and they're like, oh my God, how do I find, how do I find legislators? How do I find, you know, I'm interested in, now I'm interested in, what am I interested in? I'm interested in iPhone 5 apps, you know, like how do I find the people that tweet about iPhone yeah. 5 apps? No. Well, I think there are a couple of ways. Uh, first off, there are directories where you can find this information. Um, something as simple as there are a couple of speakers here where I just entered in their first last name and then the word Twitter into Google and easily found all of their information and their Twitter handle. But hashtags, hashtags is another great tool that you mentioned earlier, which the hashtag here is Pax NYC. Um, often, if there's a topic that I'm really interested in, I'll use a hashtag to figure out who's talking about it um, and what they're saying. And that's clearly very relevant around major national days, holidays, um, and when there's a big news event to figure out who are the top people who are tweeting about this topic. What is your strategy for you know, getting up to speed on a tool? So I think if you approach it as this is something I have to do, it's never really going to be something that you're going to be invested in. You really have to invest the time to figure it out. Not just Twitter, but any tool. Um, I constantly have to figure out, you know, between Google+, Pinterest, um, much smaller tools that we look at that are emerging. Um, and you have to dig in and, and get to know it. Um, and the way that I do that is by one, researching. So reading around the web, how are people using this? Finding the power users. Um, and then looking at how the power users are using it. You know, who are they interacting with? How are they using it? And if I can find somebody that can show me, that can teach me one-on-one, -on -one, it's incredibly valuable. Um, and I think dedicating yourself to diving into that tool, taking the time, and then finding the time over the course of a week, a month, saying this is how often I'm gonna use it until I'm familiar. And I think once you're familiar with a tool and you understand the value proposition, it feels much more natural. Um, but for most people, I think it's really important to say, most people don't experience that from the start. It takes time.